Hello and welcome to Raw Chatter. I am your host, Vicky Midwood, and I am delighted to be talking about a really important subject with my extra special guest today, Sylvia Bruce. She is a former investment banker and an integrative coach, and she has a wealth of experience in helping people in so many areas that I'm not going to list them all. I'm going to hand over to Sylvia to introduce herself, and we're going to talk about the subject of bullying, aren't we? Over to you, Sylvia. Yes, yes we are. Thank you very much, Vicky, for that uh really sort of woo welcome and uh, thank you very much for i'm delighted to be here and uh, yes i uh i'm all those things and um the reason why i became an integrative counselor coach master coach and all the things that i do now is through my own um poor mental health to what i call mental wealth experience many many years ago uh it all happened alongside when i was working in banking it had nothing to do with my banking career at all it was all stuff going on in my personal life and it was really triggered by a uh, a divorce uh, which then highlighted lots of things from my childhood some quite horrific mm. things that no one should really experience but it was really from a divorce that uh now in hindsight and at the time i didn't realize it was is what one would consider co coercive control and back right. then, the words coercive control weren't even spoken about. No. Um, and we talk about bullying. Uh, now, in my, when I was a kid, I was bullied. Right. I was bullied for being fat. Um, I don't know why was I was fat. The, was this at infant school? What sort of age are we talking that you can remember when this started, Sylvia? Primary. Primary school. Primary school. So right. probably about six seven eight nine years old right i don't know why i was fat and we, we were came from a, from a family that was very very frugal um so i don't actually know why one of those things and i remember being you know called fat fat so um hated sports day hated sports because i was never very good at all those sort of running and jumping things so it actually made things right. worse uh, so very felt very alone, very isolated. And in hindsight, that probably affected me mentally. I was very quiet, you know, the, the good kid. Uh, that was some other stuff that happened in my family. You know, there's lots of bullying in lots of different ways. I was the good kid, always um, to be not to be seen, not to be heard. So I was bullied right. as a kid for being fat. Uh, and can then, I ask when I just ask a question yeah. there? Did you, because I know that the kind of the mantra is that if you're being bullied as a kid, tell somebody, right, which is very easy to say, right, so she's laughing, that's why I'm asking, and did you say anything to anybody, or did you just keep your mouth shut about it? Kept your mouth shut about it, because there wasn't anyone in my family I could talk to, because it's very much a family of, um, just get on with things, um, right. don't bother me. Uh, it was a family, a very dysfunctional family set up, as one would call now, uh, where um, you don't speak up, uh, end of. So, and at school, you didn't want to speak up because then it would draw even more attention to yourself. Right, So, exactly. yeah, you get caught in that loop. So, no, I didn't speak up to anyone. And I think that's what people who are listening kind of need to really realise, that the, the fear of, of speaking up and the repercussions of that are, are often worse than almost than what's going on with the bullying. That's why people don't say anything and keep quiet. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. You know, it's very easy to say speak up. First of all, you've got to be able to speak up to someone and identify someone you're going to speak up to. And then secondly, you've got to be brave enough and courageous enough to speak up. And when you're a little kid, um, you don't particularly have the expression and the the articulation that you have as an adult to speak up as a kid oh exactly. you know so and so's been really mean to me oh just get on with it you know and then even when you're being bashed over the knuckles by a ruler by the you know the kids sitting next door you actually speak up to the teacher and they just said oh and you know and the kid pulls the faces to say no i didn't that feeling of you're not believed you're not Correct. listened to not heard yeah. so you just get caught in this loop yeah 
Mm. Um, and you try to be as good as you possibly can so that you're not picked on even more. And then you get picked on for being, you know, teacher's pet or always sitting at the front of the class or always handing yeah. your stuff in on a time. So you get bullied for being good as well. So yeah. you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Right. Mm. And I'm sure a lot of people listening will be able to identify with that, especially if they're kind of over 50 and come from that era where it was very much just, you know, get on with it. It's part of being a child and it'll toughen you up and that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah you know, um, and also that attitude, implicit attitude, will it happen to me? I'm all right. So you just have to deal yeah. with it. This will toughen you up, you know, stand you in good stead for life in general. Yeah. Um, and then to your point, when it happened again, when I was at um, secondary school or grammar school, then I was bullied for being different and different. There was the fact that I had a pony and other kids at the school thought I was super posh. I mean, came from a really rich family, but I just had a pony, you know, and to me it was, something was given to me to, to almost appease the bullying I had when I was uh, at primary school. So, right. and again, because we lived further away from the school, so I could never join in and after school things. So again, it was, oh, Sylvie, she's a bit stuck up, that one. You know, she never joins in. She's got a pony. She's very clever. And you'd almost try not to be all those things. Right. And I know now in hindsight, I didn't do as well at school as perhaps I could have done because it was terrifying to be, oh, Sylvie's top of the class again. Oh, Sylvie's again. done this again. So you can be bullied for so many things that people don't even realise. Right. You know, and that's why it's for being so, so important. That's why it's so important, I think, for us to talk about this, because we always assume that people kind of get bullied because they're a bit stupid or because, you know, they they come from a poor background or whatever. But often it's the other side of the coin as well. In other words, if you're what is a perception only, but at one extreme or the other, you don't fit in. And so somehow we've all got to be like little sheep and all be the same as each other. And then we're accepted. So where did that leave you, do you think, in terms of, of of you able to even be yourself? Were you always kind of on tenterhooks and aware of what you were doing and what you were saying? Were you able to ever relax and just to just be you? Or did you not even know who you were? Because there was always somebody listening or you were minding what you were saying and doing. Uh, yes, to all those questions. Um, as I say, at, at uh, secondary school, I, uh, although I didn't overtly think about doing this, my behaviour morphed into let's just blend into the background. Let's just not be seen. Mm. Let's just not anyone look at me or pay attention to me. Um, mm. But then the flip side of that was um, you don't actually know who you are, what you want to do, where you're going to go. Uh, and the effect on physicality by this time I'd uh, I, I don't know how I did it but I'd lost a lot of weight I remember at school at 16 priding myself that I would survive all day on a Mars bar and an orange wow and that's true I would survive all day on a Mars bar and an orange to actually make myself look slim so I didn't stand out anymore and so I could do sports so I could fit in at the same time, because of circumstances, living a long way from, from school and having the pony, um, and my parents were told at um, Parents' Day, quote, Sylvie is an enigma, unquote. Wow. But that thing never was said. You know, the teachers didn't ask me. My parents didn't ask me. Um, Incredible. So, yeah, it was a bit of a weird one because it was. But because no one asked, I didn't say anything either. So it's very weird, very weird. So just going to pick up on what you said there about you, you were teased when you were little about being fat. And then somehow when you got into secondary school, you you managed to lose all the weight. 
And, and although it wasn't necessarily you following a diet plan, you obviously realized that if you restricted your food and kept it to certain parameters, you could lose the weight and otherwise it worked and you could feel like you fitted in a little bit more. But anybody listening to that would go, well, that's would obviously be some kind of eating disorder. But it, back then, it's not how you looked at it and it's not how you thought of it. And I'm guessing it's not how anybody else looked or thought about it around you either. Even if they even noticed, did they even notice what was going on? No, no one noticed. Um, and this is the thing, you know, no one, no one would say anything. No one would be, you know, not even in any conversation. Um, you know, when you have lunch breaks and people get out their lunch boxes or go down the town, I just sort of, oh, I've got something to do and go off and, eat my orange and have my Mars bar. Um, but no one no one would say anything. Uh, eating disorder? What were they when I was a kid, you know, in, in my teenage years, you know? It wasn't something that people picked up on. They didn't notice. And no. equally, I wouldn't want them to notice either. No, because uh, you wanted to fit in. It, yeah, wanted to fit in. I just wanted to blend in the background. I didn't want to stand out. I didn't want any attention because that then linked into when I was a kid, you know, in my childhood and, and the family at the time, that if you did stand out, if you did do something, you would be bullied. Um, I remember taking home, uh, uh, you know, your, your, your end of year result, exam results and brothers yeah. and sisters, you know, really teasy and, you know, one would say bullying me. Oh, look at Sylvie. Look what great results she had. She's teacher's pet. And of course, then hmm, done with that one. So I won't do as much then. Um, wow. So yes, it's uh, it can be very subtle. It's not the overt bullying, you know, the you know the the physical bullying that a lot of people will think that bullying is. Right. Yeah. And, and of course, then go on. Yeah. Does that make sense then? In in hindsight, now when you look back at, at the divorce and recognizing that that was coercive control, that you kind of had gotten involved in a relationship was that was almost very similar to the relationship that you had with your family members when you were when you were younger without even knowing yeah and that that's exactly what happened you know you you're in that environment that's how one is treated mm -hmm. and that was my normal right and, right and how do you know that it's not normal because you're not in an environment to do any comparing and contrasting Exactly. So then when I met my future husband, you know, and you think, oh, he loves me. Oh, this is wonderful. He's treated me so differently. Oh, this is fantastic. Oh, this is it. I've made it. I've cracked it. And, of course, the relationship was wonderful to start with, mm -hmm. um, as I thought. Uh, and over a period of time, you don't realise that things are starting to slip. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you, you maintain one's appearance because you think it's the right thing to do to please your partner. Right. You know, you don't realize it's you're doing it because you want to please them. It's not particularly for me. And over a period of time. Uh, and at the time, you don't realize it at all that this no. person then. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example, Vicky. I remember once being in the traffic lights in the car, and this was before mobile phones as well, thinking I told him I'd be home after shopping. I said I'd be home by about one o'clock. It's now half past one, and I'm having a panic attack at the traffic lights in the car because there's, there's some road work, something or other, knowing that when I get home, there is going to be not necessarily, and of course, Bullying and crisis control isn't always fifty cuffs either. It's yeah. psychological, it's emotional, yeah. it's eroding away. Knowing that when I get home, I'm going to be absolutely bombarded. Where are you? What have you been doing? Who have you been with? Why are you late? Why didn't? Why are you not home when you said you're going to be home? And having to explain, yeah. and then again not being believed. I'm stuck at the traffic lights right. because of roadworks. Oh no, no, there isn't any roadworks. You know, and it's that it erodes away, erodes away at one's self-esteem, yeah. one's value, one's worth. And then because of the situation with my family and how this my husband was, that gradual erosion of your support team leaves you very isolated, alone. You have no one to turn to. So then when you do recognise, actually, this isn't how things should be. Right. I should not be terrified of going home because I'm late from shopping. No, no, definitely not. 
terrified that I'm coming home late from work. Um, uh, and then it's this penny starts to drop. Right. But then, similar as we just explored, then it's, well, where do I go? Yeah. If I leave him, where do I go? What do I do? I've got no friends. I've got no family. He's driven them all away. Right. What do I do? I was just going to uh, ask then, you about that. When when I've spoken to other people who've recognised that they've been in a in this domestic abuse situation, coercive control, whatever terminology you want to you want to use, but it starts very subtly, as you said, and you don't necessarily realise it's happening. But a very kind of common trait, and and, and the reason I want to highlight this is because if anybody's listening who is in this situation or if they know somebody who is in the situation it starts with them making sure that they kind of put off or get rid of any friends or family members who may be getting too close so that you yeah. are pretty much isolated and it's just you and them um, mm -hmm. and that is done in such a subtle way that you don't necessarily realize it's happening is that what happened with you very much so exactly that and i didn't know it was happening yeah didn't know it was happening you know my well was my husband you know and uh if someone didn't come round, oh but i've still got you know he's he's my life you know and i've also brought up you make your bed you lie on it um yes. to think and in health you know marriage vows were sacred uh and all this trying to make it work make it happen make it okay yeah. but it was always me doing the making me always doing the you know doing the work and him not so it, it, it's very uh very very it creeps and you it don't realize how the boundaries are slipping until they slip say from here right over to here and you think well how do i push back from there yes what do it i feels do too much yeah yeah and as you said where do you go who do you speak to who can you trust because by that point you don't even know it's hard to even trust yourself isn't it because when somebody is not believing you there comes a point not with everybody but i'm just wondering if it did with you where you start to even question whether you are indeed telling the truth because you lose that is it actually true even though there's a part of you knows what happened but because it's not being believed you start to question your own sanity. Did that happen to you? Not quite, but it's interesting, you know, as you're talking there, what did happen was that to everyone else, he was a great guy. So for me to then to speak to people that we know through, through what he did, they wouldn't believe me. Yeah because they saw him yeah. as the great guy. You know, they'd come and knock on the door. Can he fix this? Can he do this? Can he do that at work? Oh, it's an amazing bloke. And you think, well, it's not the guy that I live with. And again, you think, well, I'm not going to go and speak to these people because they wouldn't believe me. So although right. I knew what my experience was, yeah. they wouldn't believe it because they saw someone completely different. It's almost like a Jekyll and Hyde. Right. And would they believe me? They probably wouldn't. No, so, they, they wouldn't. Um, and that is again a common trait, isn't it? Where whereby the outward appearance of this person, and if we're honest, that's the kind of the person that that, that you fell for in the first place. Mm. The one that all your friends see, and the one who they are when they're with their work colleagues, is the person mm. you thought that you were getting married to. And then suddenly, as you said, it's mm. it's like a complete Jekyll and Hyde scenario. So you're isolated and you're on your own and, and kind of realization dawns. So what what's the next step? What do you do? What did you do? Well what's interesting is that um he actually forced the situation because he oh. then left me, which is really interesting because mm -hmm. He came home from work one day, had this amazing job, uh, loads of you know responsibility. And he came home one day and said to me, uh, quote, uh, Sylvie, I realise my job takes up an awful lot of my time. What time I have, I want to enjoy myself. And I'm sorry, I don't have any time for you. And that was it. Yeah, that was verbatim. And I can remember that verbatim was what he said. And Jeez. then it was, then it was, well, I'm not going to swear, but you can imagine in my head. It's, you can if you want. <laughs> what, what do I do? What do I do now? 
I've got yeah. no friends, I've got no family. I had a job, I had a good job in a bank, so I was pretty financially savvy in terms of, you know, doing finances and stuff like that. Right. But he said, right, I want you out of the house uh, within three months. Um, so it became very, very, is it acrimonious, is that the word? Really yep. nasty. Mm -hmm. However, in hindsight, weirdly, and, and, and as I'm sitting here now, I think this is weird. That was the best thing that could have happened because I didn't have to just fight to escape because then it yes. was almost as if, well, okay then, financially, as, as horrendous and as emotional as it was, I went then into practical mode. Um, right. Okay, I'll get a mortgage, buy a house, let's, you know, sort it all out. And it became really, really nasty along the way. And that, mm. that the actual separation became even worse. It was almost as if because I then could do all these practical things, it was as if I was in, in control and making these choices. And he, he didn't like the fact that I could actually respond and do these things because I think he thought I would fall apart. Right. Um, and you which I did, but the practical yeah. side kicked in. Because the practical, right. okay, where do I live? What do I do? I still need to have my job. Um, but weirdly... I didn't have to make that decision. I didn't have to leave because I didn't know where would I go? What would I do? Amazing. Um, in, in a way, as you said, it weirdly, it was kind of people listening might be going, my God, that was a lucky escape. But you that you managed to, to get out, even though you said it, it was very acrimonious and, and no doubt that was yeah. horrific and challenging to deal with without a support system. He did, in a way, actually make it a lot easier than some people find themselves in a situation where they do as you said have to escape so kind of few i mean it, it got really nasty as well because he then he then would have girlfriends and he for example, one instance it was um well you and i we we could have another go but if i end it with whoever the current girlfriend was at the time uh and we have another go it, and we and we can't make it work. I'm then left with nothing. And yet, and then if I then and we we definitely say we're finished, and I carry on with my girlfriend, and that doesn't work, I'm left with nothing. Mm -hmm. So again, this bullying, this yeah. controlling, was happening and, even while we were supposed to be splitting. Um, and that's what and, you know you yeah. talk about talking about really nitty gritty raw chatter yeah even um sexually i right. thought that even stupidly in hindsight i still thought that if we could be intimate there was still something there and i discovered that that wasn't the case either yeah. because we would do things and then he'd finish and then we go oh, i'll go off to see so and so now and yeah just so you realize you. yeah yeah. yeah, just leave you feeling that. used and, yeah. 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 So even there, you know, it's a wake-up call for me that something that's in my head very precious, very intimate, very special could even be used as a, uh, a bullying and abuse tactic. Yeah, and it's all yeah. about manipulation, isn't it? One thing I wanted to ask, and yeah. I know it doesn't happen in every um, situation like that, but you were in, in banking and you had a good salary and, and what have you. Was there control over finances as well? Or were you actually quite lucky on that score? I was lucky on that score because um, in our, during our marriage, we'd, we'd bought a house that needed complete renovation. So we'd already split it right from the beginning practically that all my my earnings would go on paying all the bills and the finances and the and the mortgage and his salary would go on renovation the building the extensions and all those things so i was already sort of pretty financially savvy so i right. knew about paying mortgages about paying bills so that did give me an advantage over many people yeah. that don't have mm. that knowledge where they're where their other half has even taken that knowledge away from them. So I did have that advantage 
that I knew what a mortgage was. I knew how to pay bills. I knew debits and credits. I knew about managing finances. Brilliant. So in that respect, I was nowhere near as disadvantaged as some yeah, are in this type of situation. And so now you've got your own house, you're paying your mortgage, and you're in a you're in a situation where you can potentially build up some kind of friends. And it's, how, how did you go about restarting your life? Because it must have been, how long were you together before you finally did go away on your own and the divorce came through? Uh, 13 years we were together. Uh, right. The last probably 18 months were the, the, the difficult ones. Um, and, and the day, because we used to, he, he moved to his, parents for a little while and then came back because he said I couldn't can't manage there and after all this is my house well hang on a minute who's been paying the mortgage but anyway that's another story uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, and, yeah there was the one there was the one day I'd, I'd bought a little car I would bought a house and he said well we could have another go but you'd have to sell the house I said well no I'm not going to do that just in case so there's one day when we both went to work, he went to work, I gone round, I got on the on the train and got home. And I had a little Nissan Sunny at the time, only small hatchback. And I had five we had five cats. So by the time I put five cats boxes in the back of this car with my clothes, there was nothing else. I couldn't fit anything else in. <laughs> so and I drove away. I drove to my other house. And that night I slept on a pile of clothes. I didn't have anything in it, just me and the cats. I had to walk to the local shop to buy a can opener to open some cat food. Um, and that, but no one at work knew any of this. No one at work knew that no. this was going on. Wow. Because again, you know, it's a private matter. And I didn't want to tell people what happened because again, I didn't want people to think as a lot of people do, um, make up their stories, mind read what had gone on. Yeah, distort absolutely. and delete and generalize and you know make up a story to suit themselves rather than listening to me uh in terms of rebuilding my life i did have a network of people at work who cool. didn't know anything that was happening so i could go out socially after work more than i i'd done before so i started to have a social life mm. i had a horse I, yeah. i'd always had had a horse as a kid i bought myself a horse um, amazing and and again this sounds like oh she had loads of money but but uh and i tell this now and it is true it's amazing i that one can because i did a loaf of bread and a tin of baked beans can last a week and that's what i used to do because my view was wow. i'm never going to allow anyone to take the roof over my head away again if I can't heat my house, I'll put my clothes on. If I can't light it, I will burn candles. Uh, and I will keep my horse if it means, and I had done, a tin of beans and a loaf of bread will last all week. Um, because, and then through the horse, you, you have friends there. Uh, yes, so really, cool. in terms of rebuilding my life, it was having a social life at work and after work. And weekends was my horse at the stables. So that's how I started to rebuild. Incredible, incredible. And so, yeah. so much resilience and, and in a way, and this is where you kind of look back and go, if I hadn't have had to go through what I did as a child, would I have been able to get on with it and be so practical and stand on my own two feet? And we never know the answer to that, never. do we? And I'm not saying that, that the bullying as a kid helped you to, to handle it when you were older, but it kind yeah. of, I guess, in a way did. But then we fast forward a little bit because the whole theme of this is, is talking about bullying and it can happen in, in different environments. We may refer to it in a different term, but it boils down to being exactly the same thing, doesn't it? You were bullied at work later on. Yeah, bullied at so, work. Yeah, bullied at work. Yeah. Sexual harassment, bullying, uh, bullying because I was a female in a male-dominated right. environment. Um, bullied sexually, uh, sexual harassment. Uh, and the first time that happened, I I did speak up and go and speak to HR. And right. they said, basically, yeah, we, we hear what you're saying. However, and probably to 
warn and pre-warn me what might happen they said you know do you realize that if you do go down this route it may have an impact on your career as well because you may then be um seen as the troublemaker the uh you know the person who causes the bother speaking up right. and all those things um wow. so i didn't want that so i left but then right. later on in my life once i'd uh recovered from my poor mental health to mental wealth because all this divorce left me in a very dark place mentally i ended up in a depression and tried to take my own life quite a few times but ended up recovering so later on i was a very different person so when it happened later in a in another environment um there was one time i actually sat at my desk and thought they have backed me into a corner here uh I can't go any further backwards. I will come out fighting. Right. And what have I got to lose? When I spoke to my boss, they weren't interested. So I thought, okay, then we'll circumvent. We'll go around the blockage and speak to someone else. So right. again, you come out fighting. Um, right. So there and is, you know, it's a very different, very different uh, experiences of that. And a lot of it depend was driven by how I was up here. Right. And so when we when we go back and I, and I just said, you know, a little bit ago that, you know, maybe the bullying helped you to be able to cope with everything you went through getting out of the divorce. But no human goes through that level of, of experience, trauma, bullying, all of that stuff, plus having to work and hold down a job and living on your own, et cetera, et cetera without it having some kind of effect on their mental well-being. And from a, from a physical point of view, you kind of keep on going and one foot in front of the other show at work. But mentally, you talked about you being in some really dark places. How did you, A, deal with it, and, and B, how did you get through it? I didn't deal with it. I kept on going, like you say, you know, that... Uh, that childhood uh, approach to life you know you make your bed you lie on it you just got to get on with it who's going to help me no one else it's just down to me so you just get on with it uh physically i ended up with um at one stage uh i was sent for brain scans because they thought i had a brain tumor because i used to suffer terribly with headaches okay and that turned out to be stress and tension headaches Right. I had all sorts of bother with my uh, menstrual cycle. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Uh, I had all sorts of bother with uh, just aches and pains in general. I Again, I'd lost a lot of weight. Right. Uh, and weirdly, probably the only time in my life, I went, wow, check me out. I'm looking quite good. And my friends used to say, but Sylvie, you look like a skeleton. You look <gasps> awful. Oh, hmm, that's not good. <laughs> right. so you and yourself yeah. felt great or yeah. that you look like. oh yeah check me out you know you get on the scales and you see the number think brilliant but it didn't mm. suit my frame didn't suit me um yeah so there was a lot of physical things that happened and, and this is during that something time. that i wanted to yeah that i wanted to highlight that because a lot of the time when we talk about mental health and especially if you've come from a background where you have been told to just kind of shut up and get on with it and stiff up a lip and all that kind of stuff we don't necessarily know that we are suffering mentally but the body's pretty damn good at giving us clues and giving us signs and this is why i'm so passionate yeah. about helping people to recognize that you can't separate physical well-being mental well-being no. because they work together and they're inextricably yeah. linked and if you have got physical symptoms there's a blooming good chance that there is something going on emotionally mentally that needs to be addressed um, mm. because it comes out somehow and it's not always in the way that we expect. But were you, when you were going through, like, maybe it's a brain tumour and what's happening with your mental strike, was there ever that connection made with your mental well-being, with all of these physical issues? No. No, I didn't. I didn't connect it at all. I just thought, I know, I'm getting all these headaches. Why am I getting these headaches? Oh, they're... You know, it's, it's really difficult. You know, they're very painful. Um, menstrual cycle, oh, that's just, just the way it is. Um, right. Skin problems, oh, was just the way it is. 
uh, I, I used to suffer with anemia badly to get a lot of mouth ulcers. Oh, it's just because I'm overworking. I think a lot of the time, Vicky, I put mm -hmm. it down to the fact that I was working too hard or, work, or working long hours. But I didn't even think about that. I just put it down to work. I didn't think that it was linked to my my uh, my poor mental health at the time. No, not at all. Not at all. No. And again, I think so many no. people will resonate with that because we just say, oh, yeah, I'm overdoing it. Uh, I, I'm just working too hard, I'm putting a lot of hours in. There's a lot going on. Um, but your body lets you yeah, know. Yeah, and if, I'm you, busy. If, you <laughs> if you don't listen, it it shouts yeah. louder until you flipping well do, doesn't it? So so what happened? Did you actually have a breakdown? No, I didn't have a breakdown. I uh, I struggled for a couple of years thinking I could I could manage. Thing I could get through this on my own, but eventually, after probably uh, the third real serious attempt, I went to my GP because, for me at the time, that was the only place I could go. Uh, I didn't want people right. work to know. Um, and the other thing that I'd also, again, with the um, with the menstrual cycles, I'd part of this also. I'd had a um, a very disturbing smear test. Uh, and right. so when I went to my GP, uh, and it was also part of that, I also had early um, onset cervical cancer. Sure. And that, my gynecologist told me that that was because he could, he could say that he could attribute that to my mental health. The yeah. fact that I'd caught a, an infection from my beloved husband nice. that had then deteriorated yeah thanks that's mm. then deteriorated into a stress related cancer induced infection wow so so and that's like really yeah. that you can actually you gynecologist can connect it that mm. much yeah brilliant. Um, i mean great that he could thank goodness but i was going to swear then but <laughs> <laughs> you can you but, don't have to censor yourself how the fact that you know, this person's behaviour has affected me and my mental health, which mm. then caused an infection to deteriorate into precancerous cells, which means that I've got to have all this treatment that I can't actually bear to have. Yeah, so, absolutely. but at work, so back to the story, the counsellor, uh, my GP referred me for counselling right. uh, and medication. And I thought, oh, I'll just give it a go. I've tried everything, can't do it myself. I remember right. saying to her, I'm such a failure. I cannot even do myself in. Please, will you help me to live? Because my thought process was, if I failed at killing myself, then I'm going to have to try and somehow succeed at living. Um, so I went to counselling and transformed. And I know it sounds trite and cheesy, but I did. Mm -hmm. I completely transformed. But it was easier at work to tell them I was having treatment for cancer than it was for my poor mental health. Um, wow. And yeah. that's and that the stigma still, yeah. isn't it? And, yeah. and and this is, you know, it's not that long ago, but we'd have thought by now things would have changed. And yet the truth is it's not changed at all, no. has it, in terms of no. how mental health is looked at. And I know we're very good at kind of talking about this stuff and bringing it into awareness, but the reality is people are stuck in the dark ages when it comes to how they think about mental health and how they speak about it. And there's still this idea that we are somehow broken, uh, not quite whole, not good enough, that you know it's our own fault and all that kind of garbage. <laughs> And yet, when we look at what you've been through and the trauma and, and then the physical issues that were caused by how you were being treated uh, by a person, but also way before that, too, it's quite incredible that in this day and age, you felt more comfortable telling them that you've got cancer than you've got mm. mental health issues and you're getting help. It's bonkers, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. So yeah. you now are helping people to yeah. yeah, I still have permanent knots in my in my in my shoulders from the stress and tension all those years ago, which are manageable. They're, they're, but it's it's 
it's the long lasting the lingering effects as well um and as you said earlier where would i be now if all these things hadn't have happened weirdly picking up on what you just said weirdly and this is something i really struggle with for many many years weirdly i'm grateful to it because it's enabled me to do what i do now right yeah no and I, no it does <laughs> i get it right and and somebody listening who has never experienced anything like this or been through any kind of of major life issues that to the outside sound horrific and you would never want to go through it to hear somebody say in a way i'm kind of grateful because it's allowing me to now do what i do and do it really really well and and I know I can definitely resonate with that, with with my my stuff and my story, because it gives you a, a purpose, a determination, um, a real powerful desire and drive mm. to help other people go through similar, but in a way that's easier for them than it was for you. And and that is kind of what you've dedicated your life to doing now, isn't it? So tell us a bit more about what you now do do. Um, and I liken it to when I was in counselling and there was a moment when I spoke to my counsellor uh, and it was suddenly I had, um, you talk about purpose, direction and drive. Up until then I worked in a bank, yeah, it was, it was a job, did it well, okay. But I then developed a fire in my belly that I ne I'd never had before, that fire in my belly to do mm. for other people. I remember saying to him, I want to do for other people what you've done for me. And that's what mm. inspired me and drove me to now to, you know, integrative counsel, coach, master coach, and all those things. Because what I do now is exactly that. I I speak up in, in uh, various environments, workplace, I talk about my own story, uh, spotting signs, that that connection between how our mental health can affect our physical health and vice versa. But moreover, what we can all do differently. It's great telling a story. Information mm -hmm. and knowledge and awareness is fabulous. But what do we do with that? And that's the angle that I come from. A lot of it is about prevention. So we don't get into the red zone. We can stay in the green zone and we can spot our signs and get back to being in the green zone if we think about it in the traffic light system. Yeah. And coaching i have a coach coaching counseling i work a lot with um weirdly survivors of sexual abuse and rape that's another weirdly specialized area of mine because i love the fact that words aren't always enough so we use other mediums art music painting puppetry all sorts of things yeah but it's all really fundamentally vicky about if i can so can others yeah it's hard work it's mm. not easy no. And there were times when it's like, oh, no. Nah. But um, the reward when you see someone grow and blossom, um, as I used to say to my counsellors, that seeing someone like me come in at death's door, either by your own hand, someone else's, or through illness, right. and see them blossom and grow and thrive and overcome, it's one of the best feelings in the world. Absolutely. It's incredible. And if I can do that, and I've had some, quite a few successes, you know, like yourself, it's it's the best feeling ever. And and, and it absolutely is. And and, the, and the, the beauty of it is that it's actually healing for you as mm. well. And, mm. and so, you know, it's kind of coming from a place of passion and desire and a, and, and a real push to want people to understand themselves and that they are much more capable than they believe but it also mm. is, is just reinforcing that actually and so am I and so yeah. am I yeah. and, and that's yeah. important for us because when you're dealing with people who have those issues you have to make sure that you are very clear with your own boundaries and just what how much you can actually absorb and take on um, and what you need to just kind of leave when you've had the session and, and that in itself is is something that we have to learn uh, over time I think but you now are, are coaching people to kind of do the kind of work that you do and and the whole um, bullying side of things is something that I just think we just need to keep on talking about even more 
and just mm. try and get rid of the stigma and the shame. Nobody asked for it. We, we don't deserve it, even mm. though at times we think we did and we think we mm. do. Mm. We learn, as we talk to people like you, that actually no one deserves to be treated like that by another human. Mm. And, mm. and if we can help others in any way, then we are giving back and hopefully they can then inspire other people to do the same. Sylvia, mm. we could talk all day um, and we could really go yeah. deep into your story, but we haven't yeah. got time to do that. There are so many other things I would have loved to have asked you about. But if people do want to know a little bit more about you, where is the best place for them to connect with you? Where can they find you? The best, best place really is on LinkedIn. I don't do any other social media. I'm on LinkedIn. I do have a website. You know, we're, we're talking about bullying and there is anti-bullying awareness week, I think next week, 13th to the 19th of November. And its thing this year is make, make some noise. So let's make some noise about anti-bullying week and let's stand together rather than stand alone. And if we see someone that is being bullied, don't be a bystander, be an upstander and, you know, and stand up to it. It's not easy, um, but we can do that. So yeah, come and come and find me on LinkedIn. Uh, email, my email's on there. Um, so yes, come and come and find me. Yeah. Thank you yeah. once again, Sylvia. It has been an absolute delight to have you on, and I shall definitely be looking out for that campaign and and commenting. And let's get everybody involved and shouting out. Thank Indeed. you, folks. Yes. Thank so. You. That is it, another cracking episode of Raw Chatter. And I'm just going to leave you with, you have one life, as far as we know. You have one body. Please take care of it. It is taking care of you. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye now.